Mike Kennedy with you. Afghanistan is in the news, so here we have a uh, knife from Afghanistan. This was given to me by a serviceman that was retiring. He spent uh, a significant amount of time, I guess, in Afghanistan. He commented that, you know, when they were off duty, there wasn't anything much to do other than buy things. I mean, you know, that there just wasn't anything else to do. And so he bought some knives. So evidently he bought a few of these and uh, he gave one to me. He sent one to me. And uh, uh, really got a nice leather case. I like that. But here's the actual knife itself. You can see it's the blade's about four inches long. And the actual knife thickness back here is a quarter of an inch. You can see it tapers down. And uh, what made me think of this knife is I was watching the Knife Center. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Of course, they're someone who sells knives. But they have such a range of stock that usually when they do certain videos, they're very informative because they're not like going to be saying, well, this knife is better because this is the one I sell. And we're not going to talk about this one I don't sell. Because they have such, like I say, a huge amount of uh, brands that it tends to be fairly comprehensive. And I'm, I'm sure there are brands they don't cover. Like I've never seen them mention uh, Dave Canterbury's knives. Or, you know, and I'm sure there's other ones that they don't. Uh, but the ones they do are the, you know from the big manufacturers, I would say. And uh, I think they cover it quite well. And now what made me think of that was he was talking about having guards on knives so that in you know situations where you're uh, maybe stressed or not paying as much attention as you should or something that have in more first time knife users, having that finger guard uh, is, is important. And, he talks about other aspects. He talks about the steel, certain knives, the way they're, the, the design of the knife and how different metals affect the different uh, sizes of the knives and configuration. He was talking about this one steel that uh, uh, holds an edge real well, but it could tend to be more brittle. So what they do is they make the knife a little thicker to counteract that idea. And there's some knives that are uh, laminated a bunch of different metals so that actually the metal that you're using for the cutting part is is not is just a thin section of that knife the met middle section so they can have other types of uh, metal on the outside to give it different properties and they can with something like that they could compromise a little on uh, something else to get something that has really good edge retention because they've got this other metal that will give it strength. Now this is only this is only one me one uh, metal. This has a name on it called Bora Knives and uh, and it looks like there's a picture of a seagull flying or something. I don't know if you can see that very well. The lighting isn't that good but anyway I like it. It's a really nice really nice knife. Uh, but so this knife center uh, they have two videos that I watched recently. They're each about half an hour long. So he talks about the 10 best knives under $100 for bushcraft. And then they have like a companion video, the best uh, survival knives under $100. So it's just kind of interesting because he goes through the different philosophies in the uh, bushcraft. You see a lot of the Scandi grind knives. Uh, because that's really, really, really good for cutting wood because the blade is thinner, uh, the, the angle is such that it, uh, it goes through wood easier. So carving casts and things uh, can be done much better. And, uh, you know, he talks about the different steels, the knives, the handles, and all that. But then he goes over with survival knives, which... He has both some small and large ones, and he, he had two folders too. Uh, but these again are all under $100, and he goes through different aspects of, you know, what makes a survival knife, how is it different from a bushcraft knife, and 
you know, one of the things they talk about is the ability to kind of split some small uh, wood with uh, using it uh, as a batoning, you know, you stick the knife. This, this would be, wouldn't be the ideal knife where it's so short too, but you stick the knife on top of the wood and you, you actually hit it with um, so another piece of wood, significant wood, and that goes down through the the uh, small log or whatever, and you cut it up finer. In other words, uh, a lot of times a survival knife, you're kind of, you, uh, some people want the properties of an ax put in there to some degree. So you're talking about having a knife that's significantly larger and significantly heavier. But he makes a good point too that uh, what is the knife as far as what does it weigh, uh, how big it is, because that may actually determine whether you actually keep it with you. In other words, <coughs> let's say you, you're someone that goes hiking a lot, all of a sudden you're more concerned about the weight, and so you, you, you don't bring your bigger knife along when you actually could have maybe used it. So, uh, you know, he talks about some weight considerations and things like that, and uh, moving away from, not that there aren't some like that, but from the Scandi grind and different things like that. Having a, you know, exposed pummel on the back for uh, cracking uh, nuts or many different things. Uh, he talks too quite a bit about the idea that uh, having this have a more of a point at the end with some of these knives so that you can you can drill in other words you can make that uh, for the friction fire you can make that little bowl that they make or or you might be doing something else where you're actually gonna maybe drill through a piece of wood and your knife is the only thing you have and so to do whatever you need to do that point becomes important uh, and he shows that some this cases that at least the standard uh, cases that come with the knives and everything. But I I find the Knife Center videos quite interesting, and I think there's always something to learn. And you know, of course, he even says some of it's his personal preference for him, himself, and what he's got uh, for an aim. And uh, anyway, I'll put the two links below. You can check it out, and uh, maybe comment below, uh, about these, uh, you know, the knives are all under a hundred dollars. I think one of them is exactly a hundred, so probably would be more tax and things like that. But anyway, it's still, uh, still very informative. And like I say, as he talks about the different issues of how is a, a bushcraft knife different than a survival knife, where a bushcraft knife might be have a big stress on. Uh, doing some carving, you know, and processing wood uh, in, and some fine details in woods like notches and things like that. Then we go over to the, the survival knives that we can tend to be bigger that, like we say, they say that is the only thing we have with us. So then all of it has to, it has to be a sort of ax too. It has to do this, it has to do that. So uh, it brings about some uh, other issues. He even mentions once too, which I think is important to mention that, you know, settlers and things a lot of times had what we would call the three knife option. And you can read about this in uh, different historical books. And uh, I know Dave Canterbury's done a lot of uh, talk about this, but the idea that basically you would have a small knife that might be a pen knife, a folding knife, a jack knife, and probably nowadays it would be a Swiss Army knife, or in my case, maybe a multi-tool, but you've got something that can do smaller tasks. Then you've got this knife that is uh, more of that that uh, bridge between a uh, bushcraft knife and a survival knife maybe, might include some of that other stuff. But since you have that smaller knife, it really doesn't have to. So all of a sudden, survival knife can get sort of bigger. Uh, originally, uh, the frontiersmen were carrying around butcher knives. But, uh, you know, we have so many more choices today. 
different knife configurations and everything. But then they would go up to a basically a full size axe if they were, uh, you know, if they were uh, had an animal that was carrying things because that that extra weight might be a lot to put in uh, to put in their pack. So if they didn't have an animal or they want to, you know, they would probably have something more in line of a hatchet or a tomahawk. So a hatchet, they can do uh, most of the things you can do with an axe and certainly more things you can do with a knife uh, as far as wood processing. But again, it uh, would probably be not the greatest thing in the world to actually try to chop a tree down with a hatchet rather than an axe. But again, if we're looking at survival scenarios or bushcrafting, uh, you know, a hatchet would be fine for processing branches and different things like that for small trees. But it's just kind of interesting and uh, I've enjoyed their videos so I thought I'd just pass it along. And again, just to show you this, uh, this knife that I believe was made in Afghanistan and uh, is, I really like it. Tell me what you think. Bye.